Thanks for joining us on our streaming service for your first alert drought forecast. I'm your first alert meteorologist, Callie Zanandri. It's really a tale of two Colorados this week. While storms have brought much needed relief to parts of the state, drought conditions are deepening across the western slope. According to the latest data from the U.S. Drought Monitor, over 50 percent of Colorado remains in drought. The western slope is hit particularly hard, with large areas now classified under severe and extreme drought. The Worst conditions are currently impacting Mesa, Delta, and Montrose counties. A dry winter with below average snowpack and unusually warm temperatures has left much of the western Colorado parched and fire prone. And that brings us to the growing fire danger. Stage one fire restrictions are now in place across much of the western slope and the high country. The message from fire officials is simple. Use extreme caution. In Teller County, an orange flag warning is in effect, a clear signal of very very high fire danger. But it's not all bad news. Storm systems last week, particularly across Colorado's eastern plains, have kept many areas drought free. Joining us this week is Melissa Schreiner, an entomologist with Colorado State University Extension Tri-River Area, who specializes in both invasive species management and insect conservation. Let's start with the big picture, Melissa. How are this summer's weather conditions like the ongoing drought, temperature swings, or recent rainfall shaping insect activity across the western slope? You know, it's been a busy season. We had a hail event, actually, that's notable. Um, on June 6th, we had hail fall for a very short amount of time in certain areas across the Grand Valley, which is where Grand Junction is located in Palisade, our fruit district. So we did have growers lose some fruit due to the damage. Hail was sized about a marble size to ping pong ball sized. It fell for only several minutes, but the damage to fruit trees that we've seen um, it's not uniform, but the the growers that were impacted were, you know, heavily impacted. Uh, crop insurance is calling it catastrophic damage. So there's less cherries this year that are marketable. Um, there's there's plenty of fruit. It's just a it's been cosmetically damaged. Um, but I've been talking to retired entomologist Bob Hammond about how he feels, you know, in 40 plus years in his work across the valley, he's never seen something so widespread. So. I mean, people were injured. We had leaves ripped off the trees. Um, car lots were damaged. Um, that definitely, in terms of impacting insects, um, you know, flowers were damaged. So some pollinators may, you know, for a little while until those flowers were able to regrow and rebloom. You know, they, everything was impacted. Um, it's like it had snowed um, on June 6th, pretty much. It was a very weird event for our area. Now, you mentioned the hail, but what about the drought conditions in that area and how is that impacting things? You know, drought is, unfortunately, it's been becoming more common for our area. Um, I think in terms of reservoirs being filled up, I think we're at an average level on a lot of them. But I think for, for drought in general, I mean, that helps suppress things like mosquitoes and ticks, but it drives the populations of things like grasshoppers. And um, we, we have plenty of those to worry about coming up in the next several weeks as they mature into adults and start wreaking havoc in our agricultural lands out here, um, especially our North Fork Valley. They seem to concentrate up there and we have multiple pest species of grasshoppers that are driven by, you know, the lack of, you know, moisture in the spring that would allow for like, uh, you know, coupled with a drop in temperature, you know, that would cause a freezing event that could wipe out entire populations of you know, that particular species of grasshopper. But unfortunately, we're not seeing those weather events and we're not, you know, we've had a very mild winter as well. So, you know, lack of moisture. So that does drive activity of especially, you know, our straight winged insects, the, you know, the grasshoppers. So it, we have another problem season, I think, coming um, you out, out west. Yeah, you mentioned grasshoppers. Are there any other insect species that are making their presence known right now? You know, several are, um, good and bad. Um, mosquitoes are really big this time of year up in our montane areas outside the valley um, where we have lots of lake ecosystems. Um, I mean, our agricultural pests are starting to pick up as it's mid-season, but nothing out of the ordinary. Just it's the time of year for their life cycle to, to make an appearance. And we've been hearing reports of early sightings of insects like June beetles. Are you seeing more early season or out of sync activities this year? And what might be driving that? You know, it, 
not June beetles per se, but, you know, come the month of March in the spring is when I noticed I was getting fauna turned in certain insect species a month early than I had the last several years. This is my fourth season serving as extension entomologist out West. And, um, yeah, truly, I can't name June beetles out in particular, but wood boring, you know, pests of trees, those adult emergences were noted four weeks early this year. So it's early on our end. I'm sure it's still um, it's transitioned to summer now and things seem like we've had a long, you know, a long, nice spring. And now things are really going to heat up this week, um, especially down in the Uncompahgre Valley where we grow sweet corn. We've got a lot of 100 degree days coming and everything's going to take off um, under that temperature regime. Now let's talk about crop pests. Are we already seeing higher counts of insects like corn earworms or other agricultural pests? And what's behind these numbers? You know, we're not, as compared to the last several years, everything is on time. The corn earworm is a migratory pest. It's a global pest. Um, Noctuid moths migrate from, you know, southern regions to northern regions as the weather allows them to move northward. And biofix, so sustained flight for the first time this year, was no different than that of the past several years. It's late May that we have insect traps out to, to capture the first of those migratory adult moths coming in from wherever they're blown in from. It's not, not really known, but massive migratory populations come in and establish in the Uncompahgre Valley and interact with sweet corn. Um, but yeah, I can't really say that there's anything um, there. It's all on time. We're watching this pest because there's new genetics in the corn earworm from its cousin, the old world bullworm. And so monitoring activity is, um, it's being done pretty intensively across the region. There is, you know, the corn growers have come together to create a scouting program and a changed spray program and they're throwing everything they can at you know assuring that they can you know do their best to keep pressure down of the corn earworm so so far everything seems to be going along as it has the last several years but the next few weeks as we start to harvest corn is going to be it'll be an interesting one to see just how folks are able to meet grade because this pest doesn't kill corn plants it damages the cob and it makes that corn unmarketable. So it's hard for corn growers to distribute that corn um, making a sale. So w more to come. Now the tick season, it's really starting to heat up. What should people on the Western Slope know about tick activity this summer and what precautions should they be taking? You know, just this weekend, I pulled a tick off of a friend up on the Grand Mesa here in Mesa County. So as tick season ramps up in Western Colorado and, and elsewhere, it's important to stay vigilant. Um, you know, take that trail that's clean cut and avoid tromping through off trail. Of course, it's good to stay on trail anyways, but, you know, protect yourself and your friends by wearing that proper protective equipment, having long, long sleeves on, long pants on. You know, using EPA registered repellents like DEET, that's important, but using, you know, a physical barrier and also just making decisions about where you choose to travel, um, staying on trail, but staying aware and being prepared, I think is really key for tick season and just being aware that they're out now. They're hanging out on plants, reaching their little arms up, waiting for something to come by that they sense and they, they grab on and will hitch a ride. It'll take a tick several days to, Maybe I think days is very common. It could be maybe a few hours in some instances, but either way, there's some time that passes before a tick will decide to embed and, and bite a person or a dog. So it's really important after hikes, checking your children, checking yourself, your, your gear, um, especially if you know you were um, off trail or in an area that you know ticks are commonly found, which are forested areas. So just staying aware that you should be doing that monitoring post hiking. With drought and not a lot of rain falling in like the lower parts of the valley, I think those areas are likely not gonna be as impacted by ticks, but areas that receive a lot of our, you know, monsoon activity and rainfall over the next several weeks, um, especially in areas on the front range, I mean what a beautiful green site it is out out east uh, driving in the denver metro area you guys have gotten a lot of rain so folks in the urban areas traveling up into those montane regions should, should you know stay vigilant because i think tick season will be worse where there's been a lot of rainfall it's not necessarily the case out here but on the front range absolutely well thank you so much for joining us melissa and we will see you back here next week for your first allow first alert drought report